Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. Professor Eric Janislawski. Thank you, Melanie. It's good to be back. Uh, nice to see you all again. And uh, I'm just going to continue to pick up where we left off last time. So we'll whiz through some of the slides we discussed earlier where we focus primarily, remember, just to quickly recap, on a God who reveals himself both through nature and through supernatural revelation. We took a look at some psalms. Then we talked about God the creator of all and a number of his attributes. And the thing that I wanted to get into today, I think we left off with the Sabbath structure of Genesis 1 and the God who gives us the moral law. And the feature that I wanted to pick up with as the theme for tonight, the second part of this two-part lecture series, uh, is the God who creates everything by means of his word and spirit. Since that is part of the Genesis 1 text, even before anything comes to be, we have God, the spirit of God, hovering over the waters, and God speaking a word, let there be, and there was. And we'll see that one of the jobs of the later you know, prophets, and especially the wisdom literature, is that they go back to the Pentateuch, and they develop the spirituality and the depth of the Pentateuch in new ways in their own ages. And the wisdom literature tradition especially, uh, something that should be uh, familiar and precious to us as Catholics, some of the wisdom literature books we share with uh, the Protestants and the Jews in their canon, some of the wisdom literature books we only have, uh, together with Catholics and Orthodox, in the larger 46-book Old Testament canon that we share. And some of these late wisdom literature books in particular, I think, contain a fascinating insight into who God is, especially how God is as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So this is a critical preparation for the New Testament doctrine of the Trinity, which is fully revealed once we get to, say, the baptism of our Lord in the River Jordan, with the voice of the Father, the Spirit, in the form of a dove, and this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, in the waters, or revealed very clearly in the Gospel, in the Great Commission, at the end of Matthew's Gospel, go therefore and baptize all nations, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Uh, there is a clear revelation of the Trinity, one God, and three divine persons in the New Testament, but there are preparations for it, even in the Old. And so I wanted to take a look at that tonight, as we get into later texts of the Old Testament as they relate to the one God and three divine persons. The one thing that I wanted to uh, do last time, but we're a little bit short on time, is it would uh, we'd be remiss not to talk about uh, one other early Old Testament revelation that is absolutely central, uh, and that is the revelation of the divine name that God gives to Moses on Mount Sinai in Exodus. Uh, this is a... Uh, probably the single most important event in the entire Old Testament. Everything about the Exodus experience gets broken open and examined in depth in later Jewish history. And in fact, even our Lord's public ministry is largely dictated in terms of a new Exodus, a cosmic Exodus, not of the Jews from slavery to Egypt into their own promised land in Palestine, but rather an Exodus of the entire human race from bondage to sin death and the devil to, through this earthly pilgrimage, a heavenly promised land that God has in store for us. And just like uh, that exodus begins with the revelation of the divine name to Moses, we will see our Lord also taking up this divine name in his own New Testament self-revelation. So I wanted to talk about that uh, first, since we didn't finish with it last time. I tried to find some uh, tasteful illustration of Moses on Mount Sinai. I always view this as a little bit further off. It looks like he's almost inspecting the root structure of this plant. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, at least it's uh, a reverent drawing. 
So Exodus 3.14 is the central verse here. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. The Lord also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus am I to be remembered throughout all generations. And so that latter bit makes it perfectly clear. Keep in mind we haven't a record of divine revelation uh, for about 400 years before this point, because Genesis leaves off with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob and his 12 sons going down into Egypt. So the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob establishes continuity with the previous revelations given to the patriarchs. This is not a new divinity being encountered on Mount Sinai. This is the same God keeping his promise to Abraham and his posterity by remembering the Israelites and promising to bring them out of their slavery. Uh, But here we have a new name revealed on Mount Sinai, and it is a mysterious name. It's translated sometimes in different ways. We have here, I am who I am in the RSV. Uh, I am who am is another way it can be translated. Or if you like the Septuagint rendering of it, I am he who is. And in all of those cases, it's a double form of the verb to be. And it's a somewhat mysterious name. The Catechism has some nice uh, uh, sort of explorations of its meaning. People have pondered the meaning of the divine name uh, for many years, and uh, this sort of goes from lowest reading to highest reading in the Catechism number 206 to number 208. Uh, The first meditation on it is, it's somewhat of a mysterious name, you know, it's a a name but also simultaneously the refusal of a name, and some, uh, some readings rest with that. And I think that's, that's too simplistic of a, of, it's not really an exhaustive exploration of the divine name, but it is a mysterious name. Supposing, for example, um, you know, since Deacon Sabatino's not here, uh, the Institute might be running amok a little bit, and uh, you go out into the parking lot, and somebody runs up and gives you a noogie, and runs away, and you don't know who that person is, and you say, come back here, who are you? You can't be doing this, giving people noogies in parking lots. This is just, uh, wait till Deacon hears about this. If you don't know their name, what are you really going to do about it? Yes? Um, There's a lot implied in the knowing of a name. You can call upon that person. You can establish a relationship with them. Uh, Part of the request to know the name of this being that is revealing itself to Moses is so that Moses might have some kind of way of going back and entering into dialogue. And if you, uh, you know, corner somebody who's given you a noogie in the parking lot and say, what's your name? And they go, oh, my name's Eric Janoslawski. I'm really sorry. I was a little carried away. Um, Then you have a way to find me and track me down. Uh, But if I say to you, I am who I am, that doesn't help you very much, now does it? Uh, (laughs) So... In some ways, though, uh, you know, it's a mysterious name because it doesn't give us something familiar, right? Uh, It's a name which is kind of like, I think, a a verbal equivalent to the Jews' prohibition on making a graven image uh, because, you know, that's the tendency. They were forbidden uh, to make molten images or graven images of God precisely because they are not to dumb God down and to put him on the level of a creature, and to think that his being, who he is, is somehow exhausted in these very limited creaturely depictions that were common amongst the pagan religions of the ancient world. So too here, uh, when God reveals his name to us, it is a mysterious name. It's a name that uh, certainly conveys God as supreme being, but in a kind of unapproachable grandeur that's hard to get one's mind around. When we think about God as supreme being, that's somewhat difficult to do. Uh, It's easy to think about limited beings, a square. It only has a certain few attributes to it. A table, we can get our mind around things that exist as table, as window, as box, as computer. But when we think about what it means to be full, unlimited being, the mind recoils a little bit because we are finite and God is infinite. 
Uh, we are transient. He is everlasting. We're in time. He's not. All those attributes we talked about last time with his omnipotence and his omniscience and his eternity, uh, this divine name gets to the heart of the matter and reminds us of the transcendence of God. One of the things that uh, is another reading of the divine name is this is, you know, two verbs that are in the present, you know, I am. In the Apocalypse, we hear the title of God that echoes what we find in Isaiah, the God who was, is, and ever shall be. Uh, and this is, you know, a nice way of saying, as long as there has been time, there will be God. He was there in the past, he's here in the present, he will be there in the future. This perhaps is an even more exact way of saying it, because for God there is no past, present, or future. He exists from all eternity, full and complete in himself, outside of time. And by saying, I am, it refers not only to his eternity, but it's a way of assuring Moses that God will be there. He's not going anywhere. He is not transient. Pharaoh may come and go. Israel's travails might come and go. But throughout all of the history of God's people, God will be there, an abiding, everlasting, sustaining presence. So some people read the divine name on the level of God's abiding presence. But most of all, uh, common enough in the scripture, you see it even through the medieval period, uh, this nice little maxim that the name reveals the essence of the thing. Um, anybody that's named a child's probably dwelt on the meaning of the name for a little bit because we think of naming, you know, as something that's trying to seize on at least our hope or our love for the child in concrete form. But when you give names to things, especially in the biblical tradition, it sort of captures the fact that the name reflects the inner essence or the true reality of the thing named. And a lot of our names for God are, are relative names, right? If we call him Lord, well, there can only be a Lord if there are people over whom he is Lord, right? Um, we can call God our Father in the sense of the Our Father, but there can only be fathers if there are children. Uh, we can call God Almighty, and that's sort of walking up to the power of God, understanding it through creaturely terms, and then expanding it to He is Almighty and not just somewhat mighty. Uh, but a lot of our ways of approaching the nature of God walk up to Him either through relation or some creaturely category. Uh, this name is in some ways the blockbuster because uh, unlike naming Him from being all-wise or, or powerful or merciful, uh, this is a name that seizes first and foremost upon what God is. Uh, he is the absolute supreme being. And that can get pretty heady, and don't worry, we're not going to do a night of metaphysics. Uh, but I do want to say that this is sort of a foundational insight that has undergirded like the Western metaphysical tradition. It's just a huge thing, and I think it was somewhat of a surprise to the ancient Greeks who were just beginning to get their heads around this a few centuries for the time of Christ to run into this relatively unlettered people. The Jews were never uh, renowned for their philosophical speculation in the ancient world that had come up not only with the doctrine of the one God, but that this God was a full, unlimited, absolute, completely transcendent, self-sufficient being, capital B, being. How'd you figure that out? We just did that in philosophy for the past couple hundred years of our proud Greek national existence. He told us on Mount Sinai <laughs> several hundred years ago. That's how we figured it out. Uh, he told us what he was all about when he told us uh, that he was the supreme and absolute being. So I did want to point that out. There are many other attributes and names of God that if we had a long time to go through, we should call to our attention. I want to thank Father for his prayer. Uh, one of the ones that is uh, extremely common in talking about covenant is God as a God of mercy. Um, you know, he gives us law. He does. He is a just God. He, you know, punishes retri with retribution those that transgress his law. And that might be to the third or fourth generation, but he shows his mercy unto the thousandth generation. And the God, the God of mercy, is one attribute that we could go on uh, for some time because the Old Testament God does stress his merciful character. But the thing I wanted to uh, connect with the New Testament, all this is sort of as the old bursts forth into the new, is that this revelation of the divine name, uh, probably some of you know this, this might be a more common observation, uh, the Jews held this name given to Moses at Sinai in such great reverence 
uh, that it became customary not to pronounce the divine name uh, out of reverence, lest the name of the Lord be blasphemed or at least taken lightly, taken in vain. And think about that for a moment as often as it might escape my lips or your lips in a moment of not uh, really mental self-position. But people so often use the names of God in rash ways. Uh, and the Jews you know, were so uh, you know, entrusted with this name of God, his personal name, the most fitting name for him, that when they would read the scripture aloud or pronounce blessing, it became first a pattern in spoken words to simply substitute the word Adonai, or Lord, for the divine name Yahweh. And then it even became customary in writing uh, that the Jews would not write out the divine name in its complete form, but would begin to make marks, substitutions, when they would even write out their copies of Scripture, uh, lest the copy of the divine name on that piece of paper somehow become defiled. And so both in spoken and written Hebrew, uh, the substitution of Adonai, or Lord, for Yahweh whenever it would appear in the sacred text uh, was already in practice by the time, say, of the Septuagint's coming to be in the 3rd century. All throughout the text, you can find where the divine name would be in Hebrew. Uh, it's translated by Kurios, Lord. Now, why do I mention that? When you have uh, the New Testament before you, I wanted to just bring together a few different statements by Jesus and about Jesus to show for us how the divine name is the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, these are often translated in ways that depends on your Bible edition, whether or not you see it clearly in English. Uh, every time you are working in translation, you've got translator's judgment calls. Um, the one that's usually done nicely is the next one in John 8, 58, before Abraham began to be, I am. But there are other statements in the gospel where Jesus says, I am, without predicate, nominative, following it, which was the short form, as we saw just a moment ago in Exodus 3, 14, the full name, I am, who am, and then the shorter form of that name, God simply referring to himself as the great I am. And there are a few moments in the gospel where Jesus refers to himself in the same fashion. Now these are not the seven I am statements of John's gospel. I am the true vine, I am the sheep gate, etc. All those have predicate nominatives. Do you remember your grammar way back from the eighth grade? <laughs> or where you have you know, a linking verb, a copulative verb. So, you know, he is a rock. Oh, predicate nominative is the rock there. Uh, he is great, predicate nominative or predicate adjective there is great. But in cases where you don't have a predicate, simply I am, ego eimi, by itself, you have the, uh, in Jewish you know, milieu, you have the short form of the divine name. Sometimes translators will render that somewhat less clearly as it is I, and I think you lose uh, you know, some significance. So depending on your particular edition of the Bible, it might read one way or the other. But one is John 6, 18 through 20. This is the scene, you know, uh, every time they're on water, it seems, something goes wrong. Uh, and part of the reason for that, by the way, is this theme. You know, we only looked at Genesis 1 and 2, but if you look at the other creation texts, the waters, the primeval waters, are often depicted in chaotic fashion. In fact, sometimes they're even personified uh, by this uh, sea serpent-like creature, Rahab, uh, and one of Yahweh's first acts in creating is reaching down into the waters and yoking this primeval uh, chaotic thing, personified as a sea monster, and bringing it into obedience and transforming the chaotic primeval waters into the placid waters of creation. So when you see God over the water, especially the chaotic stormy waters, He's already looking like his father when Jesus does this sort of thing by walking on the water, uh, commanding the sea to be still. You know that uh, moment where even in the Greek, literally, Jesus says to the sea, be muzzled. It's the same word that he uses in uh, exorcism formulas, like you're taking a snapping, snarling creature and yoking it to obedience. So when you see God doing these miracles over the water uh, and you see Jesus behaving in this fashion. The sea rose because a strong wind was blowing. 
And when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea. Obviously, supernatural behavior, but in the background of the creator God of the Old Testament, this is something uh, that would remind them of a Yahweh image. And he was drawing near to the boat, and they were frightened, but he said to them, I am, do not be afraid. And so there you have what would have been, I think, to someone who was schooled in the Jewish depiction of Yahweh as creating by commanding over the waters that they be still and placid in speaking the divine name. When Jesus says this of himself, I think this would have reminded the apostles of his heavenly father. Little companion text from Isaiah 41, 10 and 13. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my victorious right hand. For I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. I am who say to you, fear not, I will help you. Uh, So you can see even the passage has kind of an allusion to this depiction of God in Isaiah. The controversy with the Pharisees in John 8 is probably the verse better known to most people. And there you have three times, again, depending on translation. Most people usually nail 858 in this fashion, but other translators uh, may not bring out the character of John 824 or John 828 with the same strength. But if we take a look at those verses, we see three times Jesus uses the short form of the divine name with reference to himself. I told you that you would die in your sins, for you will die in your sins unless you believe that I am. In 828, so Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak thus as the Father has taught me. Sometimes that gets rendered, then you will know it is I. Uh, But again, I think if you look at the Greek, the ego emi by itself, it's just hoti, ego emi, you will know that I am. Uh, That would have been, and this is part of the background of the episode where the Pharisees are becoming increasingly incensed about what Jesus is saying about himself. The capstone is John 8, 58. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, or amen, amen, I say to you, before Abraham began to be, I am. The first time he says, I am, they go, who are you? The second time they are growing angry. And by the third time, uh, because Jesus says, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And they're like, you're not even 50 years old. You're telling us that Abraham has seen you? And he says, indeed, before Abraham began to be, I am. And see the shift there in verbs. You know, Abraham was or began to be. He was a past tense being that had a beginning point in time and lived for a while, died, and then went up to the Father. But Jesus says of himself in the simple present, Even before that time, I am. Not even I was, or I was existing, but rather the one eternal mode of divine presence proper to God as reflected by the short form of the divine name. And then the Jews take up stones to stone him. Because by this point in time, in the third saying of the divine name, uh, they are certain that he is trying to indicate by this his divine nature, and they become incensed and say this is blasphemous. One of the ways you see this reflected in the iconographic tradition, I don't have to tell uh, folks from the East about this, whenever you see an icon of Christ, if you notice, uh, there's Greek characters here in the, uh, I don't think the proper term is halo, so someone correct me uh, if I'm giving it an improper name, but this is ho on, or literally the being. Again, the Septuagint's translation of the divine name, ego emi ho'on, I am the being, or I am he who is. And so when you see our Lord, this is an uh, English language uh, equivalent of it. They've done it with English characters, I am. They put the divine name around his head. And so if you've ever seen that on an icon and wonder what it is, it's the divine name surrounding the head of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It also lends some depth to early Christian creedal statements. Uh, You know, proper creeds, the Apostles' Creed comes along a little bit later, but in Paul's time already people were wanting a statement whereby to manifest their Christian identity. And one of the ones that we see throughout Scripture is professing that Jesus Christ is Lord. And if you understand this custom of Jews using Adonai or Lord as a pious circumlocution for the divine name, Uh, then you get a lot more depth out of it. 
Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, 3, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Likewise, in Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord, or in Philippians 2, 9 through 11, therefore God has exalted him highly and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But when the early Christian church professed Jesus Christ is Lord, they were saying a lot more than simply, He is boss of me. Uh, you know, they are just saying a lot more than He is my master or He is my teacher. If you understand how Jews speaking in Greek would typically refer to the divine name, what they're professing there is that Jesus Christ is indeed Yahweh. He is indeed the one God who revealed himself to us in the Old Testament and now has taken flesh and has come to earth in the form of Jesus of Nazareth. Um, and you can see both of those things sort of very nicely put together in Philippians 2.9 because for a Jew, there's only one name that's above every name, right? And that is the most holy name of God as revealed to Moses on Sinai. And God has given that name to his son, Jesus Christ. And when he is exalted at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and earth and under the earth and confess that he is indeed Lord. He is indeed Yahweh. So the divine name, I think, is an important revelation and links us especially to the incarnate reality that is the whole goal of Jesus' public ministry. Uh, that is to say, to reveal he is not merely the human son of Mary, but is indeed the divine son of God there in one person, fully God, fully man. So I think it's useful to have some background understanding of what it means when we profess Jesus as Lord, and that all springs from Exodus 3.14. Now, the God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, while it's right to say, I, I, this is a graphically clearer copy of uh, Rublev's famous icon, Abraham's Three Visitors, and uh, it's a beautiful piece. But the thing I wanted to focus on today is that while the revelation of the Trinity is very much a New Testament thing, uh, there are preparations for it throughout the Old Testament. And I think there are fascinating steps in that development uh, that happen all by a meditation on Genesis 1. As time passed, especially in the wisdom literature tradition, uh, pious Jews began to ask themselves, what is this word and spirit of God? Because, you know, we use a lot of terms of God that are creaturely terms, but if we want to take them aright, you know, we have words going right now. My voice is, you know, the product of air going over vocal cords, vibrating air and striking your ear. But, of course, the Jews knew that God doesn't have a throat, uh, that he is a pure spirit, that he is of immaterial, divine nature. So what does it mean to say that God speaks a word in Genesis 1? What kind of word is that? And what does it mean to say that God has a spirit in Genesis 1? Spirit, either in Hebrew, the ruach, or in Greek, pneuma, is the same word in many languages for breath. Because, of course, if you're not breathing, you're not living for very long. Yes? Uh, they associated it with the invisible life force that keeps us alive because with your, they lose their breath, they die, right? Uh, when your breath goes out of you, that's it. But breath, spirit, while something that we might understand in our own human, animal composition, uh, might mean one thing to us, what does it mean to say God has a spirit? You know, and these things were mysteries in the Old Testament, but mysteries that they wished to dwell on. And in the passages that we're about to take a look at, I wanted to note some common features. First, note how they all spring from this question, what is this word of God and spirit of God that we see there from the very first biblical witness? God's word, sometimes called God's wisdom, and God's spirit pre-exist all creatures. They're there before anything else comes to be. Let me, no, let me speak even more clearly. They're there before anything comes to be. Everything that comes to be, comes to be through them. And then another thing that you see in all these passages we're about to look at is a nice principle from St. Athanasius, which is that our Creator is our Redeemer. When the Word and Spirit of God are described in sacred scripture, 
They're described as intercessors. They are coming down to earth, not merely active in creation, but active in calling all men back to God. So let's take a look at these. First passage is in early wisdom literature, Proverbs 8, 22 through 36. And this is nice because you will find this one in Protestant Bibles if you're ever sharing this faith with and it's sometimes necessary to do. Uh, sad to say, with Sola Scriptura, there are some folks that are, are Bible-believing Christians that no longer believe in the basic doctrine of the Trinity, one God and three divine persons. I think Sabatino was uh, telling us after the last talk that he ran into a bunch of, uh, uh, I think, Baptist patropassians or modalists, and they had simply discovered that as best they could tell, these were simply three names for God, and he was in no way three in reality. Father, Son, and Spirit were just names and not any distinction of person. Sometimes people will come up with this. The early church had to battle it, and history and heresy tends to repeat itself. And uh, if you're dealing with the doctrine of the Trinity, it's good to start at the very beginning. Now again, translators might do a better or worse job of this. And in light of the Arian controversy, if you know about the heresy of Arius, who maintained that the word of God was merely a creature and was not truly God from God, light from light, uh, I don't know why some Bibles translate it this way. But I gave you the preferred reading of this. The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his work before his acts of old. Uh, the RSV, I think even the RSV CE says, the Lord created me. The Hebrew word kana, uh, you know, can mean to possess, to hold, to acquire. Uh, it can use in some instances, it can have in some instances the sense of create, like to get for yourself, to make for yourself. But in a text that historically was used to support Arianism, why you would opt for the Lord created me at the beginning of his work rather than possessed is somewhat beyond me. Uh, but if you take a look at it, the Lord possessed me at the beginning of his work before his acts of old. This is divine wisdom talking about itself. Ages ago, I was set up at the first, before the beginning of the earth. When there were no springs, when there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abounding with water. Before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills, I was brought forth. Before he, meaning God the Father, had made the earth with its fields, or the first dust of the world. When he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he established the fountains of the deep, when he assigned the sea its limits, so that the waters might not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him, like a master workman, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always. Now notice so far, Clearly, meditation on the work of the six days, yes, with the mention of the creation of the heavens and the sky and the stars and the moon and giving the sea its limits. And so before any of this happened, already divine wisdom was there with God. And he's described as a master workman. Uh, this is you know, someone who was like job site foreman, as it were. We might say that in today's English. Uh, faithfully executing all of the designs that God, what we would call God the Father, has in mind. Um, and there's a love relationship between them. Daily I was his delight. There's a relationship of love between God and this divine wisdom that God has, and rejoicing before him always. And further, rejoicing in his inhabited world and delighting in the sons of men. Just as there is a love between this divine wisdom and God the Father, so too there is a love for both of them, for the human beings that they create. And look at the shift. And now we've got the redemptive part. And now, my sons, listen to me. Happy are those who keep my ways. Hear an instruction and be wise. Do not neglect it. Happy is the man who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting beside my doors. For he who finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. But he who misses me injures himself. All who hate me love death. So notice we go from a meditation on God having a word or having a wisdom from before he begins any of the work of creation. A Genesis-based reflection on the work of the six days is carried out through divine wisdom and then divine wisdom loving the apex of that creation, humanity, 
and constantly reaching out to us to bid us to come into deeper relationship with God and warning us that those who miss divine wisdom injure themselves and those that hate it love death. So there we've got wisdom as co-creator and also wisdom as intercessor, participating in this work of calling mankind into a deeper union with God. A later wisdom text, Sirach 24. Similar themes, similar pattern. Wisdom will praise herself and will glory in the midst of her people. This is a common trope. Wisdom sometimes describes itself or wisdom sometimes gives sayings uh, that we should be attentive to in the wisdom literature. So this is wisdom's self-description. In the assembly of the Most High, she will open her mouth, and in the presence of his host, she will glory. And this is what wisdom says. I came forth from the mouth of the Most High. Now, notice we've got wisdom coming forth from the Most High. There is some from relationship between them. I don't know if you have your basic Trinitarian theology in hand, but not only do we affirm that there is one God and three divine persons, Father, Son, and Spirit, but we affirm certain relations or processions of the Son and of the Spirit from the Father. Yes? We say the Son is from the Father. We say the Holy Spirit is from the Father. Some of us say also from the Father and the Son. But uh, the basic sense of not only three distinct persons but a from relationship from them is an essential part of this doctrine of the Trinity. And already in the Old Testament we have this description of wisdom coming forth from the mouth of the Most High. So wisdom proceeds from the Most High. Now Genesis imagery. I covered the earth like a mist. That reminds us of the second creation story in Genesis 2, yes? where the mist covers the ground and then the plants start coming up. I dwelt in high places. My throne was in a pillar of cloud. I alone have made the circuit of the vault of heaven and have walked the depths of the abyss. In the waves of the sea, in the whole earth, and in every people and nation, I have gotten a possession. So now we have from this, again, image of God's comprehensive power as creator, wisdom now getting a people for itself, coming down, interacting with man, drawing man into a deeper relationship with God. (laughs) Among all these, i.e. all these peoples and nations, I sought a resting place. I sought in whose territory I might lodge. Then the creator of all things gave me a commandment, and the one who created me assigned a place for my tent, and he said, Make your dwelling in Jacob, and in Israel receive your inheritance. So Israel gets a special share of this divine wisdom. And then a perplexing, difficult statement, kind of bristles with contradictions. From eternity, in the beginning, he created me. And for eternity, I shall not cease to exist. Um, Usually when you say something is from eternity, it doesn't have a beginning. And when something is from eternity, it's not created. And there, in the Greek at least, the verb is indeed create. And I think what you see going on there in the wisdom literature is this attempt to try to grapple with, in terms that are not technical, those are developed much later, like Nicaea, this notion of the eternity of the divine word or wisdom, but yet this notion that it is from something else. It is not unoriginate that the divine word or divine wisdom is some eternal other there with God the Father, somehow from God the Father, proceeding out of God the Father, but not in time. And every you know, creaturely term we use to describe the relationship of the persons is usually based on some time-based creative metaphor. Even the Nicene Creed, when it says of the word right, that he was begotten, not made, Uh, well, both begetting and making typically take place in time, yes? But the reason why we prefer begotten is because the things that we beget are like of nature to that which begets them. I've made a lot of things. I've made computers. uh, You know, I've made books. I've made uh, crude attempts at carpentry and home repair. uh, But I've only begotten three people, yes? 
uh, but begetting captures this notion of sameness of nature. Uh, the father is of the same nature as the son. And that became the term of choice against Arius who wanted to say that the word was a different being, wasn't truly God, was some powerful spiritual creature like a super angel. And Nicaea said no. And the way they express that is by using this term from John's gospel that Christ was begotten, not made. Seizing on sameness of nature. But notice, of course, all of our begettings take place in time. It's still a time-based creaturely metaphor. But the thing that you know, I think the wisdom literature is wrestling with is this notion of describing how one person comes forth from another and depends on it in the sense of it being the source of another. But this goes on, not really in time, but from all eternity. You know, we now define that in a more technical way as sort of a Trinitarian procession. Yeah? But I think we see the foundation of that concept in this sense of some eternal from relationship of one from the other and before anything else comes to be. Then divine wisdom uh, is especially established in Zion and took root in an honored people in the portion of the Lord who is their inheritance. So there's our second text from the wisdom of Sirach 24. The third one is my personal favorite. Not that that counts for anything. Uh, wisdom of Solomon 7.22 For wisdom, the fashioner of all things, taught me. So this is another one of those Old Testament wisdom literature discourses where wisdom tells you about itself. For in her, there is a spirit that is intelligent, holy, unique, manifold, subtle, mobile, clear, unpolluted, distinct, invulnerable, loving the good, keen, irresistible, beneficent, humane, steadfast, sure, free from anxiety, all-powerful, overseeing all, and penetrating through all spirits that are intelligent and pure and most subtle. For wisdom is more mobile than any motion. Because of her pureness, she pervades and penetrates all things. Now notice some of those attributes. Uh, they're eye-catching, uh, all in the sense of its holiness. It's entirely holy. It's unpolluted. It's invulnerable. Nothing can harm it. It loves the good, or as we would say, uh, it's benevolent, as one of the attributes of God we talked about last time. All-powerful is surely something that you would associate only with God. Yes? God's the only being that we call all-powerful. Overseeing all, that's another way of saying knowing everything and governing everything. Omniscient. And penetrating through all spirits, that is to say, pervading all things, present everywhere. Omnipresent, another attribute of God. So when we see wisdom being described here in Wisdom of Solomon 7, it's being given a number of these attributes which are associated with the attributes of the one God. Surely not two gods. That's why we started with monotheism last lecture as the first chiefest thing that the Jews are taught. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord is one. If we didn't have that, we would go straight into tritheism. But notice how in describing this divine wisdom, wisdom of Solomon 7 begins to give it a number of attributes that are properly divine. Then it continues, For she is a breath of the power of God, and a pure emanation of the glory of the Almighty, sometimes translated a pure refulgence, God's glory is understood as you know, his visible expression of his divine nature. Like in the Old Testament, when the glory cloud would come down, it's a bright, shining cloud. And so this is like you know, a refulgence or a ray from his glory. She is, therefore, nothing defiled gains entrance into her. For she is a reflection of the eternal light, a spotless mirror of the working of God, and an image of his goodness. Though she is but one, she can do all things, omnipotent again, and while remaining in herself, she renews all things. But I wanted to pause over verse 26. It's a rather striking statement that divine wisdom is a spotless image. We just went through a passage a couple verses previously where all these attributes we'd normally say of God are said of wisdom, and it's kind of capped off by this, that if I have a perfectly spotless mirror 
right, and I hold it up, you want to be the poster child, whether you look at this lady right here directly as I am or you look at her image in the spotless mirror, you see the exact same thing, right? This is a way that wisdom is being described. Everything that you would see in God, the Father, you would see in wisdom because it's a spotless image. It's light from light, a reflection of the eternal light. These are probably some phrases and concepts that sound more familiar to you from John's Gospel, yes? But notice how they're developed here already in the late wisdom literature. So wisdom is a breath of the power of God, or you could say a spirit of the power of God, uh, a reflection of the eternal light, a spotless mirror, an image of his goodness. Not only does she create all things, but she renews all things. That same pattern, our creator is our redeemer. Not only did God create the world, and not only does he sustain it, but he goes and renews it, even after it's suffered from sin. And in every generation, she passes into holy souls and makes them friends of God and prophets, for God loves nothing so much as the man who lives with wisdom. For she is an initiate in the knowledge of God and an associate in his works. Now, another theme that comes up in some of the later Old Testament uh, springs from this notion of the intercession of God's word or God's spirit on our behalf. Uh, the word dwelt among us. Uh, even before, what I like to say is March 25th, 1 AD. Take a look at some ways in which God sends forth his word for the purpose of saving man in the Old Testament. Isaiah 55, if we had more time, it would be great to look at that whole series of chapters, 50 through 55. It's a gorgeous section of the book of Isaiah. Uh, I, it's probably one of my favorite passages in the entire Old Testament because it starts with the covenant as marriage imagery, God betrothing to himself, his people, uh, then proceeds into two of the, uh, most, the two most well-known suffering servant passages, uh, culminating in uh, Isaiah 52 and 53, the fourth suffering servant. You probably know it from Good Friday liturgy, the most vivid depiction of our Lord's suffering, death, and indeed resurrection, and then switches after talking about how God is going to, through the death of the suffering servant, establish a new and everlasting covenant with man, switches to this image of God's word coming forth like rain. Starts with a meditation on divine transcendence. God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. So the idea of the inaccessibility of God, if we were thinking merely in terms of man's natural power to reach up to him, how could we possibly get to him? Well, if he comes down to us, it makes it a lot easier. The Jews were aware of the hydrologic cycle. Uh, they could see rain coming down from the heavens and mist rising back up to become clouds. For as rain and the snow come down from heaven and return not thither, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but shall accomplish that which I propose. Interestingly enough, exactly how the mission of the suffering servant is described just a few chapters earlier. And prosper in the thing for which I sent it. But take a look at how God's sending forth of his word is described here again. Again, proceeding out of his mouth, but coming down from heaven to come to earth for just a short time to accomplish a certain work of God on earth to revivify the earth, to help the renewal of the earth, and then to ascend back whence it came. In fact, even a little later in Baruch, the word takes bodily form and dwells, among, and dwells among the Jews. Baruch 3, 27 through 4, 4. This is a fun one. Same starting point. Think about how high up God is in the heavens and how difficult it is for sinful man to approach or grasp him. God did not choose them, nor give them the way to knowledge. This refers to the uh, giants in Genesis 6 that perished. 
So they perished because they had no wisdom. They perished through their folly. Who has gone up into heaven and taken her and brought her down from the clouds? It's a rhetorical question. The implicit answer is no one. Who has gone over the sea and found her? Who will buy her for pure gold? No one knows the way to her or is even concerned about the path to her. But he who knows all things knows her. He found her by his understanding. So God, who knows all things, knows divine wisdom. Notice how, again, they're being spoken of in a dual fashion. Yes? He who prepared the earth for all time filled it with four-footed creatures. There's your very typical Genesis 1 reference. He who sent forth the light, and it goes, called it, and it obeyed him in fear. The stars shone in their watches and were glad. He called them, and they said, Here we are. They shone with gladness for him who made them. This is our God. No other can be compared to him. He found the whole way to knowledge and gave her to Jacob, his servant, and to Israel, whom he loved. Very similar to those wisdom passages that we've seen before. Yes? And then, this is the fun one. In Baruch 3.37, Afterward she appeared on earth and lived amongst men. Wait, what? (laughs) Did we miss an incarnation in the Old Testament? This is the very next verse. It just straddles the chapter. Uh, She is the book of the commandments of God and the law that endures forever. Uh, So Baruch sees the Torah, the Pentateuch, uh, the divine revelation, the word of God set down in sacred scripture as maybe not an incarnation, since there's no flesh there, but a certain incorporation of God's wisdom. It's how God's wisdom comes down in physical form and dwells amongst men for the sake of their salvation. All who hold her fast will live, and those who forsake her will die. Uh, Very similar to the wisdom passage we just read about the necessity of achieving and holding on to divine wisdom, like all who hate me love death. Turn, O Jacob, and take her. Walk towards the shining of her light. Do not give your glory to another or your advantages to an alien people, Happy are we, O Israel, for we know what is pleasing to God. So in these five passages, we see this notion of God's word or God's wisdom or God's spirit coming out from God, proceeding forth, but somehow mysteriously, not a creature, before anything is made, coming forth from God from eternity and also being sent, what we call in modern theology, not only does The Word and the Spirit have a procession from God, but they each have missions. They are sent into history to go and accomplish a certain work that the Father proposes for them. And indeed, divine wisdom has a kind of incorporation, comes down in physical form, and is said to be present in the sacred scriptures of the Old Testament. That's how it dwells amongst men in Baruch 4.1. Now, hopefully you see where I'm going with this, but part of the reason why I think the late wisdom literature is really precious is that if you have this as part of your Old Testament canon, uh, this may be a reason why uh, some of the Jews of the second century decided it would be great to get rid of this. Uh, When you are preaching the gospel, and when you come to a text like John 1.1, the prologue of John's gospel, If you are an Alexandrian reader of the Old Testament and you have these books in your canon, there is not so big of a leap to make from the latest of Old Testament revelation to the beginning of the New Testament with the announcement of the Gospel. John 1.1, very familiar passage, but notice, standing squarely in the wisdom literature tradition, what's John's prologue kick off with? In the beginning, unmistakable allusion to Genesis 1. Yes? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So we have that same mystery, an eternal other, the Word and God, and they are together, and yet both indeed are the one God. He, meaning the Word, was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, just like we see the divine word or the divine wisdom depicted in those previous passages. And without him was not anything made that was made. 
just as cumbersome in Greek as it is in English there. But the stress you can see is that the word is not a creature. Nothing at all that was made was made except through the word. It was already there. Anything that came to be came to be through the word. In him was the life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. And then a few verses later, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth, and we have beheld his glory, the glory as of the only Son from the Father. And so there we see not only the eternal coexistence of the Word with the Father, but all things being created through the Word, and lastly, the Word taking flesh and dwelling amongst us. So all of those elements uh, are put together in a new and dramatic way, of course, in the New Testament. It's only in the New Testament that we nail down three. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That's still a little bit open-ended uh, because there are multiple names. We have no problem. We can say God the Word or God the Son and know that we all mean the second person. And we can say God the Holy Spirit and know we mean the third. But if I say Father, Son, Word, Spirit, you don't think there's four, right? <laughs> but uh, the exact revelation of one God and three divine persons, we see that clearly announced in the gospel. Um, whether it's the baptism of our Lord in the Jordan, whether it's Matthew's Great Commission, or if you want a fun Bible study, just study all of the things said about the Father, the Son, and the Spirit in John's Gospel. Heck, you can chop John's Gospel in half if you want to, and just start chapter 8 and go through the Last Supper discourse, and you will find yourself there a wealth of statements that refer to these mysteries. The one God, the Father, the Son, the Spirit, how the Son and the Spirit are from the Father, from all eternity, and how all things were made through these three. And it's that same mystery that's present even in the opening words of sacred scripture. There is the acorn. John's gospel is the fully-fledged oak tree. And so, I think it might be fitting to conclude uh, tonight's presentation with a glory be. Uh, so why don't we, and then we do questions afterwards. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end, amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you so much. Thank you. Jehovah's Witness, and we've talked a few times about the divine name. Aside from the difference in theology, can you sort of maybe explain their understanding of the divine name and how it relates to their understanding of God, aside from the fact that, like, the, the, her the heresy and all that stuff? Do you, do you mean the, their particular contention that Jehovah, not yeah, Yahweh, is the right form? Yeah, like the emphasis on Jehovah and, like, their understanding of God because of the name Jehovah. Sure. Uh, I'm not sure which of the two you want. Um, because the divine name was not pronounced for a long time, there became ultimately a question of how it ought properly be vocalized. Uh, because Hebrew originally wrote only consonants and glottal stops. And so you can do that even with English. If you just drop out all the vowels, you can pretty much still make your way through many sentences. Although there are puzzlements. Is it, uh, you know, is it uh, stop ahead or is it step high or something like that? You know, surviving the vowels. What they would do typically when they wanted to indicate a uh, substitution of the divine name, they would keep the consonants, but they would point it. Uh, later Hebrew, let me back up, developed a series of indicating the vowel quantities by a kind of points, dots and little jiggers and things like that underneath the actual written consonants. So the points were indicating how you should vocalize, i.e. provide vowel sounds to the consonants that were above them. When they made a substitution, with the exception of the first little point, which was hook special to show you that it was a substitution, they popped in the vowels from Adonai into the consonants that were yod he vav he. And so if you do that together, it would be nice if we had a chalkboard I could uh, show you, but if you take the uh, yod sound and then Adonai, ya, and then take the H sound from he, and then the O from Adonai, Ho, and then take the Vav, and then the I sound, or the long A sound from Adonai, uh, you get uh, Ya, Ho, Va, 
with the H on the end. And so I, there's been a nice history. I haven't read all of it. Um, people began to wonder how to properly vocalize it. You can find um, some people reconstructing it that way rather early. I think there was a 13th century Dominican biblical scholar that hypothesized the reconstruction of the name that way. Um, but contemporary scholars, uh, you know, recognizing that those vowels were a substitution of Adonai's vowels so that you didn't have the full-on divine name straight out, uh, do not think it was vocalized that way. Now, how do you get Jehovah? What happens is, of course, these are German scholars, and so if you, uh, the J, like Yavol, makes the Y sound. So when it comes over, when it's anglicized or taken out of German, uh, you get the, the Jehovah spelling. But it's ultimately the four consonants of the divine name uh, reconstituted with the vowels from Adonai because they did not realize that this was a substitution, so the divine name would not be written properly out on the page. Um, Deacon Vin Barreca, I hope I'm pronouncing that correct, from Long Island, New York, is writing in from online. And I hope this is on topic. Um, why is wisdom referred to in the feminine gender? Yeah, good question. Good question. Very common question. Uh, there are uh, a few different rationales that have been put forward for that. Um, if, if I usually begin with a joke, uh, I can say that's because women are wise. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, I mean, I, I, I mean, no, it's true. It's true, but I, I, I don't think that's necessarily the explanation. It's a true statement, but, um, but I, uh, I do think that well, there's a couple issues there. One, grammatically, the term, uh, both in Hebrew and in the Greek, Sophia, uh, are, are, are female. They're grammatic. You know how they have neutered nouns, the gendered nouns? You've got masculine, feminine, and neuter in classical languages. And so Sophia is a, is a female, uh, you know, noun in the Greek wisdom literature texts. So it would be, if personified, uh, personified in a feminine fashion, uh, just like word, logos, or verbum, uh, you know, is masculine in Greek and neuter in Latin. And so a lot of these words had genders, grammatical genders, and that determined when they're personified uh, the way they're personified as he or she. Uh, another possible reading of it is that, um, and I do think ultimately just to, just to be um, honest that the wisdom is feminine, that begs the question. I think it is because women are wise. Uh, men might be the technical specialists, but women have a certain breadth of the wholeness of things, and as it relates to ultimate concerns that sometimes... Uh, men with their obsessive technical details might lose track of. But a second uh, explanation for it is that uh, one is supposed to give oneself wholly in love uh, to divine wisdom. Sometimes people attributed this to a Greek pedagogical device. Um, you can see this as late, for example, as Boethius's Consolation of Philosophy. I wish that for all of my young men they only loved wisdom as much as they daydreamed all day and spent their entire time in pursuit of uh, some young gal. Nothing wrong with that. But the idea of giving yourself wholeheartedly uh, to uh, the pursuit of divine wisdom in a particularly male-oriented culture where the men would have been the ones more likely studying sacred scripture, it might seem natural that wisdom is personified uh, as a woman. Those are two. Um, there are other theories out there that are, I think, ultimately less savory, uh, some like to think of this as the quiet resting place of a decade or centuries of attempts to get a female deity as a counterpart to Yahweh, the male deity. Um, obviously, I don't think that fits with the Christian or Jewish faith, but you will see that contention out there. But I think as a pedagogical device or because of the feminine nature of the words, uh, that might be um, two reasons. There are more out there for why wisdom is personified as, as a woman. In the Old Testament, is the soul addressed explicitly? As, as to, you know, the soul is saying that we're life eternal in, in, in effect. And I'm saying, is, is, is that explicitly said somewhere in the Old Testament? Uh, Wisdom of Solomon 3, I think. 2 talks about people that think that the soul is transient and passes away with the body. So if you take a look at Wisdom of Solomon 2, we get the wrong view first. They reasoned unsoundly, saying to themselves, Short and sorrowful is our life, and there is no remedy when a man comes to his end. No one has been known to return from Hades, 
We are here born by mere chance, and after here and hereafter we shall be as though we had never been, because the breath in our nostrils is smoke, and reason is a spark kindled by the beating of our hearts. When it is extinguished, the body will turn to ashes, and the spirit will dissolve but like empty air. So there's the materialist view, right? The, the, those that think that the, the spirit just perishes with the bodily life of man. But in the next chapter, um, Wisdom of Solomon 3, we get the author's view. But the souls of the righteous are in the hand of God, and no torment will ever touch them. In the eyes of the foolish, they seem to have died, and their departure was thought to be an affliction, and they're going forth from us to be to their destruction, but they are at peace. Um, for though in the sight of men they were punished, their hope is full of immortality. Having been disciplined a little, they will receive great good, because God tested them and found them worthy of himself. Um, and then like a gold tried in the furnace, he tried them, and like a sacrificial burnt offering, he accepted them. Uh, in the time of their visitation, they will shine forth, they will govern nations, uh, they will reign with the Lord. And so um, you can see there that there's clearly a picture of the afterlife of the soul for the blessed that will be an afterlife of eternity with God. Um, so those are reasoning wrongly, according to Wisdom of Solomon 3, that think that the soul perishes with the body. Uh, and then we get a Greek image and a Jewish image. Uh, the sufferings of this life culminating in the uh, you know, crossover experience of death is like gold being tried in a fire. You put you know, ore in an oven, it looks like it might be being burnt up or destroyed, but what happens is the dross is purged off and the pure gold comes out, or switching from Greco-Roman to Jewish, uh, a sacrificial burnt offering, the idea is that it goes through the flame but is given over to God and goes to be with God. And so that might be one, um, one passage. Uh, oh, I'm forgetting, three verses earlier. This is another one, just three verses earlier, 2.23. For God created man for incorruption and made him in the image of his own eternity. Uh, so think about that. It's a Genesis meditation on what is the image and likeness of God. Our standard catechetical answer is, you know, uh, intellect and will is the way that man resembles God. But when Wisdom of Solomon 2.23 thinks about it, it says, no, just as God goes on forever... An image of that in the soul is the fact that the soul does not perish with the death of the body, but goes on forever. Yeah, so Professor, you mentioned in Isaiah 8, or Isaiah 55, 8, uh, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways. And your translation says the Lord, my translation, oracle of the Lord. Can you tell me what is the difference in that translation? Because I've always struggled with that oracle of the Lord in the Nabri version. Oh, okay. So um, they might be a little technical there. There are different modes of prophetical speech, right? Sometimes the prophet gets a vision. Sometimes he uh, hears a speech but doesn't see anything. Uh, sometimes he's described as, you know, uh, hearing the word of the Lord. And sometimes he's charged to say something, you know, to the people. And so when, uh, in, in Greek, it's usually a logion, a logion, L-O-G-I-O-N, as an oracle or a saying, uh, but the, what they might do is, the, they might be translating there, and if I had the Greek text in my palm top, we could look it up, or we could look at the Hebrew, but it might be sort of a saying of the Lord is the fundamental sense of an oracle. Oracle to us sounds like some sort of smoking pot and uh, uh, enchantress, like telling the future, uh, but the original sense of an oracle or a saying is simply uh, a, a short verbal utterance that is a divine revelation. So something that is publicly announced. Like the oracle at Delphi, you go there and she tells you your fortune, but the oracle itself is the pronouncement of this supernatural revelation. Uh, so too here, when God gives these short sayings, they're described as sometimes logia or oracles. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist. Pray for us.